Hi. Uh, Hi. Welcome, everyone, to the Gray Art Gallery's first ever oral history interview with Michelle Wong. My name is Monica Marchese, and I'm a graduate student in museum studies at NYU, as well as an intern at the Gray. Before I begin our conversation, I will introduce Michelle, who's the Gray's longest running staff member. Um, she joined the gallery in 1980 and has remained on staff for 40 years. That is during all but the first five years of the Gray's history. During her time at the Gray, she has worked on almost 270 exhibitions, some of which she'll be talking about today. Michelle currently serves as the Gray's Associate Director and Head of Collections and Exhibitions. One of her current major projects is a full online documentation of the Gray's collection with the goal of making it a virtual study resource for students, faculty, and other scholars. Among her many duties at NYU, Michelle regularly lectures on museum studies in the Graduate School of Arts and Science and on arts administration in the Steinhardt School. So with that, I think we should get started, Michelle. Hey, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> um, so I wanted to start off with a little bit about your background um, and your education. Um, so would you mind telling us what your undergraduate degree is and where you earned it? I, sorry, I went to um, NYU. I was in the Stein Art School. I, I studied studio art and art education, and it was 1976. And so NYU was a very different place that time. And um, I loved it. I loved being in the village. At that point, NYU was much smaller than it is today. So it was a more of a commuter school. So there were probably 50, percent of the student body was were commuters. So I joined student activities right away and just to get involved. And it was a great resource because I sort of was, you know, part of the, the whole school and, you know, had access to, it was run by a PhD fellow. So it was good. So I heard more about scholarships and, and all these programs and student clubs, which then I joined the um, art club at Steinhardt. And there I was able to um, do field trips. We did a field trip to the Barnes Foundation and then also organize exhibitions for undergrads because we, we didn't have, um, there were no gallery space for undergrads at time. Mm -hmm. um, were there any uh, notable projects that you worked on that you, were your favorite? Well, when, because, like, because there were no undergrad um, gallery spaces, um, student activities told me that the student center had um, space for art exhibitions and we just had to sort of like book it in advance. And so I arranged a lot of like exhibitions, including one with myself involved. And we had like some a stipend and we were able to um, print invitations and have an opening. That time wine and cheese was a real big thing. That time <laughs> in the gallery and it was fun. And it wasn't until years later that when I was working at the Gray that the same space that showed that, that had the, the art exhibitions also was where the NYU art collection showed the collection before the Gray was established. So that was sort of fun fact to find out when I started working here. Great. Um, were there any professors that stood out in your mind? So when I started NYU, I, of course, thought I was going to be an artist. And, and it was all these, int like, I guess the core curriculum is what you call it now. So I had an intro to drawing, one and two, taught by uh, Professor Robert Capellas, who had a reputation of being sort of this wild and crazy professor. And to me, you know, when you're a freshman, you come you know, from Jersey City, you come in and he's got Frank Sinatra blasting and, and he's sort of yelling at all of us what we had to do. And it was the first time we had, um, we drew from a live model and a live nude model, which was a bit of an eye opener for me <laughs> at that time. And also we started doing, it was the first time I did critiques. So he would make us hang all our works on the wall sort of anonymously. And that was pretty harsh. Um, mm -hmm. And I realized that it was, I don't think I was going to be an artist. <laughs> and, and, but had enough um, sort of credits to do art education. So I sort of stayed and, and did the both. But he was really a, a strong influence because he really sort of loosened all of like the whole class up. I mean, in terms of drawing, 
to just to not think, just to sort of just draw. And then another professor I had was um, in photography, Jer um, Jerry Pryor, who just started, who's now a, a full-time faculty member. And he introduced me to photography. And that's when I think I sort of fell in love with photography because I really liked taking pictures. It was all black and white. I didn't do color and I developed my own film and it was just, you know, working in a dark room. I really loved that sort of flexibility and manipulating photographs. So I really took as many courses as I could with them and actually wanted to be a photographer. But then at the same time, I also took a printmaking course and I, with Krishna Reddy and I did um, silk screen in high school. So I really wanted to go further and he was the master of printmakers. And I found out later also he is in Mrs. Gray's collection. Um, he well, I was teaching at NYU at the time. So we, Mrs. Gray purchased the work um, while he was in New York. And he was, he did this sort of um, technique called viscosity prints, which was sort of, can't really quite remember what it was, but it was sort of layers and layers of, of plates. And I really loved that, but I had to stop doing that because I, the fumes and the, and all the uh, equipment was toxic to me and I had to sort of stop, but, but I stuck with photography. Mm -hmm. I still like to take pictures. <laughs> uh, when did you um, start to get into the museum field? So as a commuter, I also put myself through school and I was given college work study. So the first year I was working in a regular department at NYU, like educational psychology. But because I belong to student activities, to get to the offices, I had to go through 80 Washington Square East, which is now sort of like a contemporary art gallery for NYU, in addition to also where all the master's students do their final thesis, which is a, a solo exhibition. So I became friendly with the PhD fellow who was in charge and I started working for him as a work study and we, that's what we had to do, basically work with all the master students, Ed Steinhardt, whose final thesis, final thesis was to work on a solo exhibition and work with them on planning it, framing it, hanging it. So that's when he started teaching me a little bit more about hanging, because when I was in the, the student club, we just sort of, you know, used common sense, you know, tape, push pins, whatever. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing that, it was him and the faculty who was an uh, advisor who was in charge, Marilyn Karp, told me about the Gray, that I should go and visit the Gray Art Gallery. It was still fairly new. It opened in 75, so it was 1977. And it was in, you know, I was in a building that I never had classes in, so I didn't really like walk by there. And that it had very interesting shows. So I, it was across the street and I started going there and I, that was when I was like, wow, this is like a museum, you know, right here on campus. Um, I was trying to think of some of the first show I think I might have seen was what it was might have saw was um, photographs from mm -hmm. Sam Wagstaff collection and it was like a lot of maple thought. So. And so you started um, working at the Gray in um, 1980 and what was your first position there? Well it was actually 1979 so when I started visiting the Gray to see shows regularly the front desk, which is where you've been a work study, uh, was occupied by staff members and volunteers. So I became friendly with the assistant director, Jim Clearwater, because he was just this really friendly guy. And he, was talking, you know, he always would talk to everybody and whoever came in and we became so friendly because I would regularly visit the shows. And, and I told him I wanted to work there. And he just said, well, unfortunately, they only could allow one work study. So like what we do continue to do at the gray we try to keep our work studies mm -hmm. but he kept me in mind and i would continue to visit and then i guess it was like the spring of 79 he all of a sudden would just say jim always was like this very lively guy and he would just say hey can you do signage and i was like yeah you actually can because i used to do i do calligraphy and that's another way how i put myself through school but i never did anything large scale and sign it because they needed a sign um painted but this is before vinyl cut. So they had sign pictures. <laughs> so this is like really archaic, you know, for you to listen to, but I guess they couldn't afford the sign painter. So I said, sure, I can do this. You know, I can't believe I said that because I had to make this huge, where all the full windows of the gray paint this giant 
sign, American Paintings, the 80s. And I had two feet of space to paint this in. So there was really no perspective. We were completely exposed in the window. Um, so we had a lot of characters knocking on the glass, trying to talk to me. Uh, and my friend, because I sort of, you know, talked my best friend in, also in Steinhardt to help me. And then we painted the sign. And then he said, hey, the work study that was supposed to come back, you know, is not coming back. She's going to another school. And do you want the job? And I said, yes. So, so the first day I worked at the Gray was the opening of American Paintings, the 80s. And we had over 350 people attend and it was a total zoo. It was, <laughs> it was really, well, you would understand sitting at the front desk. I mean, yeah. we had to like count all the people. And then the catalog was being sold for 1198 or something. And so we had all this change and, you know, this was art world's much smaller and it was a contemporary art show. So it was all the, all the artists were, you know, like Susan Rothenberg, there was all these artists that were alive and were coming to the show. And then all the dealers like Leo Castelli and Mary Boone. So it was a little bit of like a paparazzi thing for me. It was like, wow, all these people that I read about. So, and then yeah. I started working at the front desk. Um, what initially drew you to the gray uh, specifically? It was like working on um, seeing the exhibitions and they were very different than what we were doing at 80. And then as a work study, um, I was more involved because we were such a small staff. So the exhibition was literally installed by the gallery manager, uh, assistant director, Jim Clearwater, who hired me and Gary Reynolds, who was the curator and the registrar. So the two of them were hanging the shows. We had move, the galleries are different. It had fabric walls, the walls were, you know, you can move them around and, and the work study, that was me. So I just like, by the time American paintings ended, cause I didn't work on the installation, but the deinstallation, we were packing the show up and getting the next show in, which was a surrealism show and so I started working with works of art that I studied in our history. So that yeah. was when I decided, I really fell in love with that. Just seeing, you know, painting in a crate where it wasn't sort of put on a pedestal, so to speak, on the wall. It made me sort of really connect with the work. Mm -hmm. so, and um, I said, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you go ahead. <laughs> no, I just, um, no, what was your next, ask me something and then I would probably, and combining a bunch of different questions you have. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned the chaos of that first opening. Um, what was it like in the first, uh, in the early years of the gray um, in general? Well, I sort of did the same thing that you were, that you do at the front desk is that you, you know, you're sort of like the face, people walk in and you count them and then you check their bags and and it depends, it depended on the show, which I'm sure you probably felt too. It really depends. You get a different type of audience. With American Paintings, the 80s, which is my first show, was very controversial because it was curated by the art critic, Barbara Rose, who sort of made this projection that this is what paintings would be like in the 80s. And because it was 1979. So it caused this huge uproar with all the critics. We, the New York Times just trashed the show. They had the chief critic that time, Hilton Kramer, which then brought in more people because everyone started, you know, it was a very verbal sort of art world that time. And so it was busy and it was fun. And, you know, and it was nice to be sort of protected behind the front desk because I was, you know, so intimidated to talk to sort of like all these like big, you know, celebrities. And I mean, I didn't realize like David Byrne from the Talking Heads was a regular at the Gray in the beginning, had no <laughs> idea who he was. It was before he did the Talking Heads. He was just David until someone else on the staff who was doing our press, Michael Boudreaux sort of went, oh my God, do you know who that is? And, you know, we've had like a selection of celebrities come in, just sort of like Richard Gere came in one time and, and sort of, so you have that sort of being behind the front desk, that, that sort of shield, you're not that in awe or intimidated. So that was, that was a lot of fun, sort of dealing with celebrities coming in, pretending that you're like, oh, hi, how are you? And then like, oh, my God, <laughs> it's called Lagerfeld, you know, that's how he came to see so, Sonia Delaunay, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I was so involved much more than how we do our work study day that we were, I was definitely much more connected with the staff and doing things with them more because we were just, I was like, 
I worked as many hours as I could manage. And it being one work study, I was just, I just wanted to work there all the time. And so I would either volunteer or, or work there. Mm -hmm. And the last show I worked on as a work study was David Hockney. And we did a big fundraiser where the director who was very connected also with the fashion world got Barney's to host a, a benefit at Roxy Roller Disco. So that was a big eye opener too. A lot of celebrities came to that. And so it was very sad because that was the last show and I was graduating. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, had a job working as a graphic designer and calligrapher, but that was so boring compared to like my whole that year at the Gray. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you recall any um, early professional experiences that had the most impact on you? Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, all the shows were were challenging, and depending. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Um, well, I guess David Hawking was very exciting to work with because he was like a celebrity artist and the opening I remember we had people lining around the block and then then I I guess I should tell you how I got to work at the gray and then what happened was I graduated and then after that I really missed being on campus because I was doing this boring job as a calligrapher and a and a graphic designer so I kept visiting um, the staff and that's when they told me that because I worked so many hours, I was so, so critical in getting the shows up. They actually applied for a grant with NISCA and got money for a full-time position. And Mrs. Gray was supplementing whatever else that it didn't cover, like, you know, your benefits. And she, and she actually continued paying for it until the university decided to accept as a full-time employee. So they, of course, asked me, was I interested? And I jumped and said, yes, I did. So I guess that time we were working on Sonia Delaunay and Sonia Delaunay passed away right in the middle when the show was coming here so we had to do a huge memorial service then I just it was just being so young and working with this art with the art world and having such a intimate sort of like basis with them and with the collectors and the artists which is what I always like remember um and then working on the shows, you always deal with a some sort of a, a celebrity. I'm just trying to think like with um, in my early years, you know, when we did these benefits, they were always done with a fashion component. So we got to deal, those were always fun. I'm just trying to think, we did also two other shows when Bergdorf Goodman hosted events for us, uh, bringing a fashion show in. And so we got to work with, you know, fashion designers and, top modeling agencies and then combining it with art. Um, also, when we did one of the best shows I thought we did was uh, Lee Krasna and Jackson Pollock. It was called Krasna Pollock, A Working Relationship. And it was more for Lee Krasna to let the art world know how influential she was to Jackson Pollock because she sort of put her own career on hold. And my job was to sort of keep her happy because she's been known to be very difficult and she might have been, but to me, she was great. And it was nice to hear her sort of reminisce about what it was like to be a female and an artist in the 1960s. And it was a struggle. And she was with that sort of whole group of Ninth Street women that they just um, wrote a book on with um, Helen Frankenthaler and Grace Hardigan and Elaine de Kooning and how all and so it was interesting because I just finished reading the book and it was sort of all the things she talked about was like, wow, I can hear her voice <laughs> sort of saying that. Um, I'm trying to think what else we did. Um, we, oh, we, one of the shows was also when we did Frida Kahlo. It was the first time Frida Kahlo was sort of shown, I guess, as an exhibition. The United States, Robert Littman again chose the show. It was a show that was done with the Whitechapel Gallery in London, but Bob always redid all the shows. I mean, he really had an amazing eye. So he just added another 25 or 30 paintings from Mexico of Frida Kahlo. He really wanted Frida to stand out. And that that was crazy. I still remember that show. It was not fun if you were sitting at the front desk. <laughs> mobs of people right. coming in. And the last day of the show, I, it took me two and a half hours to close the gallery. I couldn't get people to leave. <laughs> 
I can imagine. <laughs> it was crazy and it was pouring rain. So we had this big mound of like wet umbrellas and I had to mm -hmm. call Jim Clearwater, the assistant director, because he lived in the area. And I just, I can't get people to leave. People aren't leaving. It was the last day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can absolutely imagine that chaos. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a little um, crazy. I'm just trying to think what other shows I'm just amazed. And then we did a show um, that I love personally was, um, the fashion photographer Louise Dahl Wolf, who was one of the earliest women photographers and the first to shoot models outdoors. So we sort of um, worked, J um, Jim Clearwater and I would drive out to visit her in New Jersey. She was living in, I forgot where in New Jersey, but it, there was a lot of trees there. It was very pretty and worked with her on uh, picking her show. And it was like, that was really nice. And she, I was, she was, very sweet to the staff. She gave us each a photograph, which I still have. And, and I always remember how nice she was and how she survived photographing models in the 50s and sort of where it was sort of like the male photographer, fashion photographer dominated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think of, I don't know. There's so many, there's too many shows. Mm -hmm. so those are the early years. Did you? Okay. <laughs> We can go on to later years if you want. I don't Absolutely. Know. All right. So, so with, with Tom, with Bob, yes. And then we did the, the biggest show, which I did that we never showed here was um, Picasso, the last years, mm -hmm. which is from his years from, let me see, I wrote it down here from 80, 74 to 84. I think it was his last year, the last 10 years of his life where he, people, the art historians deemed him as being sort of like this sort of crazy, like elderly man who was just doing all these, he would do like 30 drawings a day. And at that time, professor at the Institute of Fine Arts, Gert Schiff was sort of rewriting that saying, no, he was just brilliant. And he knew his time was sort of ending. And, you know, the, I mean, he was just, his mind was just at full force in terms of creativity. So we did the show and that time the registrar slash curator left the gray and I asked Bob Lippman, the director, that I want to be the registrar because I was already helping Gary already on a lot of the registrarial duties. So it was the first time that I had to bring this exhibition, all Picassos, and this is pre-fax even. So it was done through the mail or telephone and borrowing from you know the family and a lot of works in Japan actually because the Japanese that time bought a lot of late works. So we did this exhibition, we did this publication and the insurance was so high that NYU did not want to take that liability. So we had to sell it to the Guggenheim Museum. <laughs> but it was sort of, for me, an accomplishment that I was able to bring together, I don't know, it was like a hundred works of Picasso all across the world for the first time. And I did that. And then when the Guggenheim took over, they had to also they added more works, obviously, and they had to redo everything. And they had to hire like two people to do that. So, mm -hmm. um, so we, I always like to plug that in because that show has gone down in history as being one of like that changed Picasso's sort of um, history in terms of saying that the last years were very important. And I'm looking at thinking about what the insurance values were then is sort of like pocket change to what they're worth now, those paintings. Uh, so, and then with, we just did a lot of shows with Bob that were sort of contemporary and, but interesting um, that had, and just also he had a whole different crowd. It was a very social downtown Soho because Chelsea is what Soho, like Soho is what Chelsea is today. So, and you can just work directly with, now they say you have Gagosian, so you never really get to talk to Gagosian, but I remember I could just pick up the phone and talk to Leo Castelli mm -hmm. or, you know, Paula Cooper. And it was, it was, so that's what it was like that time with, um, with Bob. So you really sort of felt like you were very connected with everybody. And then he left and Tom Sokolowski became director. And it was different time, it was the eighties. And we had to, to deal with AIDS which was, uh, you know, very depressing. And so Tom did a lot of sort of groundbreaking exhibitions. We were one of the first exhibit um, um, in institutions that did an exhibition on artists of AIDS. 
people with AIDS. And Tom was also a co-founder of Visual Aids. And he started, and it was sort of him and his colleagues on that who just started the Red Ribbon. And that's what I can't, I always associate the Red Ribbon to Tom because the Gray Art Gallery cut Red Ribbons, I don't know, thousands and thousands of Red Ribbons every day. And we put them and we give them out and we would wear them and we would send them to other institutions. Mm -hmm. And he also did a lot of shows on um, um, diversity too, which is, which is good for that time. So he brought a sort of a, a more grimmer sort of um, what the gray was, but it was important because it was sending messages out that other like the bigger museums weren't doing at that time because it was still very formal and conservative. Mm -hmm. And then with Lynn, she sort of combined both. <laughs> And so that it was good. She sort of, cause she knew both, both directors and she knew, and she sort of um, did a combination of doing exhibitions that would, would normally not come, that should come to New York, but mm -hmm. there was no other venue that can take it. But at the same time, she stopped, you know, we, we didn't do contemporary shows, which is sort of timely cause we, sh we shouldn't now because Chelsea is, five times the size of what Soho was in the eight, in the early 80s. And then we started working more on the collection, which is interesting, which is nice. And that's, it is timely because of Mrs. Gray's uh, Middle Eastern and uh, Near Eastern and Far Eastern collection. Mm -hmm. Now gotten a lot more recognition while nobody heard about her stuff in the, uh, her works in the, in Bob's time. Do you have any personal favorite exhibitions that you've worked on? Uh, there's a lot. I mean, you did, you just counted 269. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> I couldn't believe it was that many. Um, I, I'm just trying to think. Um, it's a combination of, there is a lot. I'm just trying to, during Bob's time, it was, you know, Krasna Pollock and David Hockney, which I talked about, and Frida Kahlo. Um, and then with um, with Tom Sakalasi, which is great, we did an Andy Warhol show of the early uh, his early years when he was a graphic designer, and that was actually a lot of fun because it wasn't like the Warhol that I was used to seeing all the you know. And I was lucky to have met Warhol when I was an undergrad because I had yeah. a friend who worked at Interview Magazine, and I was invited up to the lunches and. And I was totally intimidated. I just sort of sat there, didn't say a word. And he just sort of stared and didn't say a word. <laughs> <laughs> but his early years, when he did like drawings for um, I Am Miller, he did like um, fashion drawings. He worked for a, a leather company. So he did these beautiful drawings with snakeskin design, sort of whimsical cartoon type of drawings. I mean, he was, it, th those are beautiful. I didn't know he was such a good draftsman. And so we did the show, the early on business, Andy Warhol was curated by Donna DeSalvo, who just retired from, from the Whitney. Uh, she knew him, worked, she's like her lifelong vocation has been Andy Warhol. So she wanted to do a show of his early works. And the MoMA was doing a show of him as an artist. So um, we were competing with MoMA, which was sort of fun to do. Mm -hmm. And that was a fun show. It traveled, it went to, we sort of followed where the MoMA show went. So that was fun. And so that, that was interesting. And we got to meet Warhol's family and meet his, you know, he's from Pittsburgh and um, from sort of like a blue, a working class family. And his nephew was super nice and remembered, it would tell us stories, what, how all these little sort of things that Warhol gave him when he was a child, like carved a whole bunch of erasers and made rubber stamps. And we showed mm -hmm. that. Um, so that was that was a show. And, and then with Tom, we also did a show against nature, American, um, a Japanese um, painting in the 80s, which was also very controversial in Japan because they were not really um, into contemporary art, Japanese art. And so we, so Tom, we co-curated with MIT. Uh, it was Tom, the curator at MIT, that time, the director who then moved on, and then two curators in Japan. So it was the first sort of international exhibition we did. And we remember, how do we communicate? 
So the fax machine just got invented. And I remember we opening this fax machine in the office, like trying to figure out how it works. That was the only way you could communicate. It was so funny. And Tom was very funny because he would talk to the machine going, oh dear, it's not working. And it was, but that's how we did this exhibition. I traveled to five um, exhibition, uh, five institutions, big ones like SF MoMA, um, Cle uh, not the Cleveland Museum, um, Akron Art Museum. Um, I can't think of the, the tour. It was the first big major tour that I did. And that was so, and working with another institution because I did all the registrar work and then the, the chief prepared at MIT did all that and did all this sort of installation and, and it was, it was fun. It was also a groundbreaking um, exhibition because there were a lot of women, there were at least three or four women artists. And I remember one female artist saying Japan, first of all, she shouldn't have, she shouldn't be an artist. Um, she should be a mother and a housewife. And she did these sort of ball gowns that she sort of deconstructed and made very ugly because of the whole growing up with Disney. So these, these Cinderella ball gowns that had like whips and blood dripped on it. And so it was sort of, it was for them, it was great to do something like that. And being also working with Asian artists, for me, that was sort of, you know, for me, that was sort of interesting because I really have it all this time. Mm -hmm. And then with Lynn, as I think every, uh, practically every exhibition I enjoyed working with her, <laughs> it was more, um, um, cause I got, we got more involved and we started doing more. We have more, t we do, we did, we do less shows a year with Lynn, but you spend more time on it and you learn more from it. So mm -hmm. I can say almost every show I enjoyed working with her and the whole staff. Mm -hmm. Um, groundbreaking, let me just, you know, we did, we started showing works from Mrs. Gray's collection, Iranian art, and really highlighting the work, which we never did before. And when we, when Asia Society did a show on modern Iran, um, it was interesting to see how they did that. And we, and we were a big lender and we realized, hey, we have a really good collection. And we started working on more exhibitions related to that. A mm -hmm. um, little bit of a segue, but what um, other positions have you had while you've been at the Gray? Oh, I was writing that down when you asked me. <laughs> There's a lot. I think I did. Mm -hmm. So I started the work study. And then from there, it became the gallery monitor preparator, which is sort of what um, Noah is right now, who you know, who you work with. And then um, assistant to the registrar because the registrar was also the curator. It was a little different. Um, the staff was different that time. And then I became gallery manager, uh, which was sort of still being the registrar, but also overseeing the um, installations more. And the assist that time we just, there was no longer an assistant director that oversee that. It was just a preparator. And then it became head of collections and exhibitions and the registrar <laughs> still. And now it's sort of this other, t this title, associate director, head of collections and exhibitions. I forget, I have to look at it to see what it, and <laughs> it's basically all those, all of that combined. I'm still the registrar, mm -hmm. you know, I still can, you know, unpack a work. <laughs> I still want to physically do that and you yeah. know, handle the work. So it's a lot of positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like they were all very helpful to what you do now. So. Yeah. Well, the thing is that you just want to get involved, like, as you know, as, as now that you're an intern, as work that you sort of want to get more involved. And when someone gives you something to do, you say, can you do this? You say, yeah, I can do that. And then you like, and if you're good at it, you know, they, we tend, we keep going back to you for it. That's how I started. I mean, it was mm -hmm. certain little things that I, I could do calligraphy. So that I started doing all the signage. You sort of make yourself indispensable that way. And then I was really good at hanging labels quickly and fast. And they used to be typed and cut out and then put on the wall. And mm -hmm. I could type. So I used to do that. And, you know, now I probably can't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any uh, favorite memories that stand out to you over all of those positions? Um. Let me see. I'm just trying to think. 
I think it's, it's always nice meeting people, um, whether you think they're, you know, we've gone through our ups and downs with curators, like some are really a dream to work with and some are very difficult. And I think both are very important and you learn each step of the way. Um, when I first started The Gray, it was tough. Robert Lemon was an, a brilliant director, but very demanding and very tough. And he would forget that I was a work study student. I learned a lot. He was a mentor to me, but I remember getting very upset and Jim Clearwater, who was a great, who to this day is still a close friend, was always great with students, with people. And I learned a lot from him. And he would always say that if you um, take every challenge, working hard and dealing through difficult times is actually a better training. Um, than having everything too easy. I guess it's sort of like parenting. You gotta you know, be <laughs> up with your kids a little bit. And so that's, um, that's what I've, with every director, there's always been different challenges here and there. And I feel like even though I've been in the same job for 40 years, it's sort of like I've been in three different jobs because I've had three different uh, directors with you know, different ways of managing the staff. Did, mm -hmm. I, just, did I just like go off? And not answer no, that's, okay. that's perfect. <laughs> um, so you have witnessed these uh, changes in directors. Um, how has the the culture of the museum changed uh, from director to director? Well, it's also changed with the time. So, in when the gray was very young and new, it was more like a I guess sort of like what you study in our history, like you know, and from inventing Danton the shows and the Danton see. It was sort of like more party-esque, you know, it was fun. Um, people weren't that conscious about, you know, the proper protocol of handling art. I mean, in those days, we, we only used gloves rarely, not all the time. And, and I remember when they were delivering paint, truckers would come off, you know, the truck with, you know, with the cigarette hanging out of their mouth, which is like, now you will report them if that happened. Um, and so I was, you know, so close by um, down NYU is a little bit more grittier. It wasn't as safe as it is now. I mean, the park was very sort of dangerous when I was in school, a lot of drug dealers were there. And actually up until I was working full time, we would allow the NYPD to sort of hang out in, in, the, gal in, in the gallery. And so they can like look out at the park to see any sort of you know, um, illegal activity going on. Mm -hmm. So that's how it changed. And so there's, as the village got safer and our shows got more ambitious, we started getting more press, we started borrowing for more institutions. And then also the major museums also started to work with institutions like us more. I mean, it was very hard to borrow at that time from the big museums because we were a small little university gallery. So I think it's gotten more formal Mm -hmm. now and it's it's so much paperwork and I've been doing sort of the same thing for the last 40 years but now it's just 10 time more steps well before you can just call make the arrangements on the phone and then it would arrive but now there's like a million emails and there's a certificate of insurance and I I understand why it's just the world is bigger and you have to and there's you have to make it everything safer and you want the staff to to feel safe to handling something that's you know, heavy or could be dangerous, you know, moving it like, you know, like Donald Judd. And then, um, then at the same time, I, I think it's good to do a little of both, which is why I like staying here. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, so you mentioned that you started to highlight the, or the museum started to highlight Abby Week Gray's collection uh, more over the years. Would you talk a little bit about um, some memories with her? Well, I, met her, I guess, in the late seven, um, I think I met her probably 80, 81, and she was already uh, a little bit more fragile. She was ill at the time, but I always heard wonderful stories about her um, through the staff. She was really incredibly close with Robert Lippmann. It was sort of, um, he would call her at least once a week and go visit her. Uh, Jim Clearwater was actually the first staff member she met at the Gray because he was hired before Robert Lemon. It was the interim director who didn't stay long enough. And so he always talked about how nice she was because she would call and check in on him. And I just remember that she won some sort of, um, I don't know, 
trip to Ireland for, for and some something she gave to, and she gave the tickets to Jim and his new wife that time because they didn't go on a honeymoon because you know it was just hard. And so I always heard all these kind things she did, and she was send us like bonus. She was a Christian woman, so she would send us like Christmas bonuses that she would have Bob give out. And so I remember getting a bonus from her, and I was like, wow, you know, it's like. <laughs> But she was also not like warm and fuzzy that I remember. She was very, very nice and very um, proper. And she was always, you know, had her pocketbook and and had a quiet type of voice. Her brother, though, who was the reverend, who was a reverend at St. Luke's Chapel, was very lively. And he used to come to all the exhibitions um, and introduce himself. And so I actually remember him more because he was very sort of, sort of this funny guy and, you know, like looking at art. Mm -hmm. And then with her collection, yes. Um, so the other, the Iranian collection we worked the most with, we already did exhibitions already and, and the Indian um, somewhat. Turkish, not until the most recent show, Modernism, which you can see is my virtual background. Um, but Parvi, Parvis Tanavoli, who is one of like the, the leading um, modern Iranian artists you know, of Iran is still living. And we've had like a relationship with him. I've been in touch with him since I've been working here. He's just been great. Um, his painting is like right over, I guess, the right, if you're looking at the screen. And uh, even now when I talk to him, I still take more notes because he met Mrs. Gray when he was 23, when on her second trip to Iran. And he became sort of like uh, an advisor in terms of how to buy art. And that's why I think the Iranian collection is so strong because he was part of this group, which is sort of like the abstract expressionist second generation in New York. He was with this group of young contemporary Iranian artists. And she, that was what she wanted to do was to like support these emerging artists. Mm -hmm. She amassed this huge collection and we continue to work on it. And we are, we have been this sort of like this source that people write to us when they want to do research. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I've known these works for a long time. Mm -hmm. like um, so we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to ask you um, one last question about um, how uh, being an Asian American has changed or shaped your experiences in the field. So when I first started, I didn't meet anybody that was Asian American for the longest time at all. Um, and then I, what I remember the most, it was in 1990, was my 10 year anniversary at, the, at NYU. And Tom Sakalasi, Tom Sakalasi was director at that time and asked me, what did I want? And I said, I wanted to go to an AAM meeting because we never had funding for that. Because I wanted to you know, meet my colleagues. I didn't, I didn't know how I was compared to everyone else and to meet the vendors that I've worked with. So I went, it was in Denver, Colorado. Um, I was the only Asian registrar there. And from what I heard from the vendors, probably there was one more, but they couldn't recall who it was. And that was it at that time. There were more curators that were Asian American, I think. I met a few. There was one who was a curatorial assistant at the new museum. And there were a few, but not that many. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's so, is it, there's still not that many, but there are definitely more. Um, museum studies, when I lecture, you definitely see more Asian and Asian Americans there. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, uh, and um, artists too, there were, I mean, San Quan Chi, who we did an exhibition of, used to come to the Gray to our exhibitions, but you, you sort of didn't hang out with each other. You sort of want to assimilate. And he used to come in the mouse suit. And I was like, why is he coming in a mouse suit? Now I understand why. But when we did the exhibition at that time, I didn't know. And then another um, Asian American artist who passed away, but he was part of our collection. And so he used to come by the gray a lot. And mm -hmm. that was sort of very few. So it has changed, it's increased, but the, I think there's still more, there are much, there's still more, I think mm -hmm. we should include of every sort of ethnic group. That time was predominantly just me. <laughs> um, and just some concluding thoughts. Um, looking back on the first time you stepped into the Gray Art Gallery, what has changed the most? Oh, that's hard. 
I think uh, what's changeable is that we do have a, I think the gray has really done well in the last, all the years I've been here. We keep um, making a name for us and we have this reputation now, which is, I'm very proud to have been a part of. Um, the fact that pe people come to us for, you know, we have a lot of um, students, not just at NYU, but uh, graduate students that approach us for advice and, and we're able to provide that service is because we're just, there's not, it's not a bureaucracy. We have to go through so many doors to get in, like if you go to a big museum. And I think that's, and we, our publications have been with, um, our, have really um, made an impact on our history. Mm -hmm. All of them to the because some of I it's the night like the Ninth Street Women book that I'm reading that they're referring to a lot of the early shows that the Gray did, which I thought was pretty amazing. And then all mm -hmm. inventing downtown, all our downtown New York downtown books that have been done under Lynn's directorship has um, are real keepers and should be used in our history classes. And I think how we reach out to students, we're finally at a point where it's students know about us. I mean, we've worked all these years and it's not just us, it's other university museums. How do you get the students involved? And because maybe we're bigger than we were, but not too big, we like to let everybody know, including you, of course, to have that door open and, and ask if you want to learn something. So that, that's, it's, that's what I started feeling. It's different and it's separated us from, we're, uni we're a museum, we do museum quality shows, we, we handle things just like other museums, but at the same time, we have this sort of intimacy with students, mm -hmm. which, which is important. And being 40 years now, I'm sort of glad now I'm on the other side of yeah. that. So. Well, thank you so much for all of your thoughts and your time. Um, do you have any last uh, memories that you would like to add? No, there's too many spinning in my head. <laughs> um, I'm glad we did this. Um, mm -hmm. It's nice to sort of get, talk about certain funny things that I just talk about because I'm going to start being a storyteller, you know, with every new intern or work study. And, mm -hmm. and now that we've done this, I hope that um, when we, that when, if we do open up, when we can open up again, that, you know, we, you are more involved because now you've done both. You've done, you've been an intern and you've been sitting at the desk. So you're sort of like starting out like I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. <laughs> and you do signage is what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I can learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again. Um, I think we'll conclude here. All right. Sounds good.